Jesus' name. This last month, we've been focusing on joy. So I want to ask, as we've been talking about joy and as our, uh, our rams have been filled full of joy, how's it going? <laughs> how's it going? Woo! That's a little, uh, woo! <laughs> Not sure if what's behind that, but <laughs> joy is essential. I was meeting with some area local pastors this week over at luncheon. We have a, a network of pastors in the Hermitage, Donaldson, and Old Hickory, and Mount Juliet area that get together. We try to get together at least once a quarter, if not once a month, and we just get together and encourage each other, eat a meal. And, and they were asking me specifically, you know, what the Lord has been sharing or through our, our message times. And I got, I got to share with them that he's been speaking a lot about joy because joy is essential for us. And I I believe that if you're like me, you are inundated with messages that are contradictive to joy. You know, you look on social media, you look on the news, you know what's coming politically in our culture, you know maybe even what's going on in your families, you know what's maybe going on in your marriages or your relationships, and you understand that there is probably, if you're like me, and if I could do a show of hands, we'd probably be the majority, have experienced what you would feel like an assault on your joy. How many of you felt that? There's been a, I believe, a, 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 there is constantly an assault on the body of Christ to kind of steal its joy because joy is the one thing that the body of Christ has that the world does not have in the measure that the world has. Now, don't be, don't be confused the world experiences joy. It's a temporary kind of joy, but the world experiences joy. And so what I'm referring to is a joy that we were saying about this morning that when it fills you up, it spills out of you and splashes on people around you and they don't understand it because it's Not what they're experiencing necessarily unless they are in Jesus and full of the Holy Spirit. Joy is a vital element of our faith. And it's not just a cute message that we can focus on for a few weeks to try to understand and grow in our knowledge of what joy is. Listen, I can't teach knowledge into you. I can teach you about joy, but there's only one who can put joy in you. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. So today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to just touch on a couple of things to teach you about joy so you don't go out of here and saying, well, they didn't teach me anything about joy. They just, they just, they just moved in the Holy Spirit and we didn't, we didn't really learn anything. I'm going to make sure you learn something about joy and then we're going to give some time to impart to you this joy that the world cannot give you because we have to have this joy to fulfill what Jesus has mandated us to be in the earth. Amen? All right, let's talk a little bit about joy. I'm going to teach you for a little bit. Now, let me do this. I've been reading, I've been reading like I've never read before, and I'm loving it. I didn't have time to read when I, was, when I had a lot of children, but now that all my children are grown, man, I've got like four books going right now, and I just, I love it. I love it. I just finished yesterday a book that was written sometime between two, the late 290s to maybe early 300s. Okay, this was about the time that the Bible was being canonized. So it was just been a fascinating read, and I just finished it yes, yesterday. And it's written by a, 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 a man by the name of Athanasius. And Athanasius was living at the time, he was a young man during the time when the Bible was, was, was being canonized. So he had access to all of this biblical information that was, that was being pulled together to, uh, to be formalized into the Bible that we know. So the perspective is really fascinating to hear him talking about all the things that we talk about every day, yet it wasn't actually formalized in a Bible yet. It was just messages that had been written down from Paul, and, and they were on leaflets in different places, and, but it was still the same gospel that was energizing people and fashioning their faith even before the Bible was com- compiled. So it's a very fascinating read. But he made this statement. He makes this statement throughout the, the small little book. He said, Jesus came 
for, one, for, for two purposes. He boils it down to this. Jesus came to teach and to heal. He came to teach the world about his father because they were worshiping his creation and they didn't know him. And so Jesus had to come in, in physical form because he needed to teach them about his heavenly father. So he came to teach. He also came to heal. We can look at Jesus' ministry and we see that he was busy about his father's work, healing people, opening their blind eyes, healing their sick bodies, uh, healing them emotionally, forgiving them from sin. So Jesus' ministry could be summed up, is summed up through in this little book, that Jesus came to teach and to heal. So I'm going to teach a little bit, and then we're going to ask the healer to come and fill us with joy that will rid us of the ailments of anxiety and fear and all of those things that are limiting us and keeping us from being able to be the people God has called us to be. Amen? Okay, let's talk about, uh, the, the, let's talk about this. I, I'm titling this, The Road to Divine Joy and Perfect Happiness. The Road to Divine Joy and Perfect Happiness. Now, when we talk about happiness, happiness is a, is a universal emotion. It, it, it crosses denominational lines, it crosses racial lines, it, co- it crosses uh, national lines. It is, it is something that is in each person that every single person on the planet wants and needs. You know, most psychologists say that there are uh, four, primary, four primary basic needs in humanity. There's a need for water, there's a need for food, there's a need for air, obviously, and there's a need for shelter. And fifth on that, most of them agree, is happiness. Happiness, we, those of you who have, have struggled with depression, you know where that takes you. I mean, it, it debilitates you and, and strips you of life. And so happiness is a universal need. It's a universal need. It's why it's even written in our United States Constitution, the pursuit of happiness. Our forefathers even knew that this, this, this thing we call America, is, it needed to, that needed to be an element to give people an equal opportunity to, to pursue happiness because happiness is such a vital element. It's out of the wellsprings of, well, happiness is actually just a product of joy. It's, it's really the fruit of joy. When you have joy inside of you, guess what? What's your face look like? It's right. I was getting ready this morning, and I was passing by the mirror a few times, and I kept looking at myself, and I looked, I looked tired. And the Lord said, Chris, smile. And so when I smiled, it was like, wow. I don't look as tired. So I started smiling while I was getting ready. And every time I passed by the mirror, I looked better. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you the same goes for you. The same goes for you. If you can get this joy that Jesus promised us, if you can get it in you and not just know about it, but have it in you, I'm going to tell you, you're going to look different. You're going to look like what we prayed over Flory that his countenance will be upon you. You see, that's not just a nice little prayer. We're actually declaring things over Flory's life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his countenance come upon you. You see that? It's on there twice. So your countenance has a lot to say about where you are. And so joy. But let's talk about some things that, that, that bring us joy. Because I said earlier, this, there's a lot of things in this world that bring us joy. I just made a list. I, I just, out of off, getting ready, I thought, okay, so what are some things that make people uh, experience earthly joy? And I come up with these. Relationships, right? Family and marriage and children, Food. How many of you enjoy food? Love food. Love it. Success. Money. How many of you rejoice when you get a raise? Or you get that promotion? You get a little smile on your face. (laughs) Right? 
You don't ever frown when your boss says, I'm giving you a raise. Do you? There's joy. Sexual intimacy. Pure sexual intimacy brings, brings emotional joy to our lives. Notoriety. Entertainment. I'm a little more joyful when the Cubs win. Okay? It's okay. It's, it's a part of our life. We get to enjoy this life, and there's things that bring us joy. Entertainment. Your material possessions. You, you experience joy when you get a new vehicle, or you may put, do something to your house that's new, or whatever, when you have those things. It, it brings a sense of joy. Your talents and your hobbies. Those are just some I listed. You may have some more. All of these bring varying degrees of earthly joy, but because they are of the world, they can't bring us sustaining or everlasting joy. Now, so that's not to negate the joy that they bring. Okay, it's to put a perspective. What I want you to have is a perspective today. It's okay to enjoy these earthly sources of joy but you must have the proper perspective because these things will go away these things will fail to supply you with joy they're only intended for you to have temporary moments of joy how many of you Laura and I will have been married 40 years next spring 40 years now I can tell you And she would say the same. Not every one of those days has been joyful between us. Okay? Just being honest. By nightfall it was because we did make a vow out of that Ephesians passage saying don't let the sun go down on your anger and give the enemy a a foothold. We have have lived by that. And I'm going to tell you, it may have been right up to 1159. (laughs) But by golly... Before we went to bed, we were going to iron it out and we were going to go wake up our children if we needed to and say, hey, listen, I know you saw that. I know you heard that. But mommy and daddy are okay. You can go back to bed in peace. Okay? So I'm going to tell you, even your best relationships, your best friendships will at some point fail you because they're earthly. They're, they're temporary. They only have the ability to supply you with a, a, a small amount of of joy, but it's still joy. I want you to have that perspective. Okay. Earthly joy is beautiful, but it's it's temporary and not sustainable. Let's talk about this heavenly joy. I will tell you this. When I I became a believer in um, sometime in my teenage years, my mom was real solid with the Lord, and, and, and so I remember receiving Jesus about age 15. But there was a journey between age 15 to uh, later in my life that I I would say that I was saved, but I, man, I sure didn't, wasn't making choices like I was saved. Some of you are not in your head, you know what I mean. That time lapse between the time that you you say, Lord, I I believe Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and uh, he's my Lord and Savior, and I confess him as my Lord and Savior, to the to the, that begins the journey. That doesn't mean at that moment I became absolutely, per- I became perfect in God's eyes. So if I die at any time between that, I'm, I'm okay with God. But there was a process of, of me learning that as I was going through life, I, I thought, man, I'm just not, I, I'm, I've got places in my life that are fearful. I'm anxious about life. And I started noticing early on in our marriage that there were things and in, in life circumstances that were coming at me that caused me to, to steal my joy. And I knew scripture said I was supposed, this, this relationship with Jesus was supposed to supply me with joy. And so I went through a number of years early on in our marriage, and I, I was, kept asking the Lord, Lord, why am I, why do I still feel like I, I'm not experiencing this joy you're talking about? And so I started getting around some charismatic believers, and they started talking to me about the Holy Spirit. And they kept, they kept referring to him as power, and that there, would, there was another baptism. See, I was raised Baptist, so we, we had a, 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 the one baptism was the water baptism of John. And, but Paul tells us in Acts 19 that there's a, the, the other baptism is, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? 
So I was like, well, maybe there's something missing here in my life because I've, I've not experienced this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's a, another baptism that I need to get so that I can be, really feel the, the fire, the firepower that I need to live this joyful life. And that happened to me. I sought earnestly for the Holy Spirit of God to baptize me with fire. Now, that's a dangerous prayer, folks, but it's the most dangerous prayer you can pray because if you really want to have the kind of joy I'm talking about today, the sustaining that faces fear and destroys fear and destroys anxiety in your life, you have to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit to burn that out of you. It had to be burned out of me. Now, I can tell you, there's a vast difference in my walk with Jesus before my baptism of the Holy Spirit and the, the, the Chris after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Theology, I don't know where you, where you, where you land on that, but I'm going to tell you my personal experience is there is a vast difference between water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I realized after being around some people that I watched going through life, Mike and Donna Savolta were a couple of them all those years ago. I watched them go through hardship with joy, with faith. They always declared the faith, the, the truth of God's word over life circumstances that were hard. And it's like, that's what I'm missing. I'm wallowing in this fear and anxiety. I need that. And so I started praying earnestly for the Holy Spirit to come. And he showed up. I don't know that there's no formula for it for you. You just have to, as Paul says, earnestly desire, earnestly desire. If you really want the kind of joy we're talking about this month to be that sustaining, that faith building, that courageous joy that faces hardship with faith and excitement and adventure, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's go into the second part of this because there is a source, a heavenly source of joy. We talked about the earthly source of joy. There is a heavenly source of joy that comes through the person of the Holy Spirit. And it starts with a mindset. Uh, I'm not going to go into um, all of this, but Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is a, is a sermon, and I'm just going to highlight it. I'm not going to read all seven, all three chapters, five, or Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I'm not going to read it all. But it's interesting to me, as I broke this down this week, the things that Jesus is talking about in his Sermon on the Mount, in, in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, are the very same things that I just mentioned when I went through my list of things that bring joy to my life. The things, the, those 10 things above, he's addressing almost every one of those in this Sermon on the Mount in some way, shape, or form. And what he's saying is there is a, there you need to develop a perspective. You, when you come to Jesus and you get the Holy Spirit, he doesn't just give you joy, he changes your perspective the way you look at things, the way you think about things, and that the, the person of the Holy Spirit inside you empowers you to be able to stir up joy in the midst of hardship. That's why Jesus starts this sermon, interestingly, and this is the part that, that just blew me away with the message today, or I mean with the worship today, because he starts off with the Beatitudes. He, Jesus starts off his Sermon on the Mount with this mindset. Listen, folks. I'm about to tell you how to have divine joy and perfect happiness in this life. I'm, that's what his message is about. If we, if we could sum it up, it's about how to have divine joy and perfect happiness. And so he starts with the Beatitudes. And how many of you read the Beatitudes and thought, man, that sure doesn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't feel blessed if I were persecuted. Do you feel blessed when you're persecuted? Do you feel blessed when, you're mourn, when you mourn? Do you feel blessed when you're poor in spirit? Do you? No, but you can, he's saying. There is a way. And this word blessed is a, is a fantastic word. It just basically means what I just said, divine joy and perfect happiness. It means the same thing in the Hebrew and the Greek. Different words, but it means the same thing. There is a way to live in Jesus Christ. There is a way to experience divine joy and perfect happiness in Jesus. And so the first, the first thing he talks about is the mindset. That's just Matthew 5, 1 through 12, the Beatitudes. 
in Matthew 5, 13 through 20, he's talking about your purpose, your identity. He's talking about that. He's talking about your purpose. What's your purpose? You're, you're here to be salt and light. You remember that? Okay, I'm, not, I'm just going to highlight these. You can go back in your study and, 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 and see. So uh, you're in your own time. Matthew's, Matthew 5, 21 through 48, he's talking about relationships. Matthew 6, 1 through 18, he's talking about your approach to righteousness. In Matthew 6, 19 through 20, he's talking about your money, your finances. Matthew 6, 25 through 34, he's talking about food, shelter, and clothing. The Lord started talking to me about that during my personal journey. He said, Chris, you're, you're so anxious about everything. Seek first my kingdom and, and righteousness, and all these things you're so concerned about will be given to you. That's from the Sermon on the Mount. That's right there. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And then Matthew 7, 1 through 12, he's talking about criticism of others. Re, you know, how we respond to that towards, uh, and towards people. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, he's talking about your humility. And then 7, 15 through 23, he's talking about the fruit of your life. What's it look like? And then he sums it up with, in 7, 24 through 29, about what is your life built on? And so he goes kind of full circle. He says, this is the perspective that you are supposed to have, that you can have in me. And now he asks the question, what's the foundation of your life look like? Is it built on earthly joy or is it built on heavenly joy? What's it built on? Because he says, the wise man builds his house upon what? The rock. The foolish man builds his, sand, his, hand, his house upon what? Sand. What does sand do? What happens if you go down to Florida, spend all day in the hot sun building that sand castle, taking pictures of it? What happens when you wake up the next morning? It's gone. It's gone. So you have a choice. And I ask you this morning, what is your house built upon? Is your house built upon the temporary joys of this life? Or is your house built upon the everlasting joy that comes from Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit? What's it built upon? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it with this passage in John and then we're going to go into some ministry time because some of you need to get completely filled up with joy this morning. Again, I can't teach you into joy. I can teach you about joy. I can teach you what Jesus said about joy. But to get joy, you have to receive it from the Holy Spirit of God. You have to desire it. You can't manufacture it yourself. You can't put things in your life to make you think that it's going to make you happy only to see it fail and not deliver. You need and we're going to have a time of impartation for joy today. But listen to what Jesus told his disciples. As he was getting ready to be crucified, the Last Supper, you know this, but think of it in, from this perspective. He says this. He starts off the conversation in, G, in John 15. I'm not going to read this first part, but he says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And he's saying it's important. Apart from me, you can't do anything. Now, obviously, you can do things, but you can't experience my Father's kingdom the way you need to apart from me. If you want to experience the things that I talked about, Jesus said, he didn't say this, but he's referring back to, if you want to live like those Beatitudes, you've got to be connected to me. You've got to be in the vine. Because apart from the vine, you, you can't do anything. And he goes on to say this in 15.7. If you abide in me, listen closely here, folks. If you abide in me, this word abide is very important. And you might need to highlight that, underline that, meditate on this word. Because this word abide does not mean visit occasionally. As is the habit of some in the church. 
This word abide means to stay, to remain, to continue on in when you break it down into its original format. That means you never leave this place. If you abide in Jesus and my words abide in you. Now, folks, listen. This next part trips people up. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Some people say, well, that never happens for me. Well, I would ask the question. That was a conditional statement. If, if you abide in me and if my words abide in you. It's conditional. It's not like a, a magic word. There's a condition. Most of the time, we're asking God to fix things that happened outside of him. We're asking for things that have nothing to do with him. We're asking him to come in and clean up our messes and asking him to do things. And we wonder why he doesn't. Well, maybe you need to get back in. We got to abide. We've got to abide, and his words have to abide in us. Now, if you just picture that. Jason calls this my sandwich sermon. If you abide in me, picture yourself in Jesus. Okay, you're in Jesus, and my words abide in you. You are completely sandwiched in God. You're completely sandwiched in Jesus. You no longer exist. The world should not see you. The world should not see you. The world should not see me. They should see Jesus and Jesus' words. But you see, we want the notoriety. We want the fame. We want the recognition. We don't want to offend. If you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as my Father has loved me, I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, there's that condition again. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. What? Jesus, I thought you had unconditional love. Is that what the world says? He didn't say that. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. He spoke these things so that his joy could be in you, not the joy of the world. That doesn't mean he doesn't want you to experience joy from the things that he's created. It just means that if you, the kind of joy that is required for you to be salt and light, to be a representation of the Father, for you to experience the promises that he has he, he is endowed to us through his Holy Spirit, we have to abide in him and his words have to abide in us. What's the foundation of your house look like? What's your house built on? Mine for many years was built on the knowledge of God, but I knew I needed a power source to get it running through me so that I would not only experience for myself, but my wife could experience it, my children could experience, my neighbors could experience the presence and outflowing of God through my life. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not the fruit of your labors. I'm going to say that again because some of you need to hear that. Joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God in you, not the fruit 
of your labors. If you need joy, I want you to worship team to come up. I want to go back into that song, that that second song, because it's the Beatitudes. The first step to getting us filled with joy is getting a mindset shift. We have to shift our mindset to understand that there is a difference between earthly joy and heavenly joy. There's a difference between physical joy and spiritual joy. One is temporary, the other is eternal and everlasting. I want our church and the church of Jesus Christ to be filled completely with the joy of Jesus. If you need joy, I'm going to ask you as we go into this, just come up here. And I want to create an an atmosphere of joy. And I want us to come and get filled up. Folks, you leak. You leak. We experience joy even in Jesus when we have the Holy Spirit in us. I do. I, I feel, I, 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 I call on the Holy Spirit and I get filled up with joy. And then I go out into the world and I face certain things and I leak. I love, love what Jill Austin used to say. She said, we're just a bunch of crack pots. So we get filled up and then we leak. And we've got to get filled back up. We're leaky pots. God bless you, Jill Austin. Father, you are the source of joy. We thank you, God, that you have placed us in this world it's so beautiful we are in awe of your creativity we're all we're in awe of the things we get to experience here but father we know at best it's temporary at best it's temporary and we know that life comes at us so hard so fast and we need that living water that wellspring of of life that can only come through knowing you, but also having the grace and power and presence of the Holy Spirit inside of us. You need the wellspring. You need the Holy Spirit of God. I'm telling you that from personal experience. I've tried to do it with head knowledge of Jesus and it can only got me so far. I needed the power and presence of God in my life. So, Father, we're going to set the stage for you to just come and touch your people. And I'm going to ask you, Father, because we are in this place right here. We are abiding in you. We're we're, we're abiding in you and your presence right here in this room. May our words abide in us. How do you get the word abiding in you? It starts by you confessing Jesus as Lord and master of your life. Can you confess him as Lord? Can you confess Jesus as Lord of your life? That's how you know that you have the word in you. Some of you just need to do that as a starting point. Confess Jesus as Lord of your life. It starts there. That's how you have the word abiding in you. He is the word. Receive Jesus. And now if you've received Jesus and you've, whether you've invited him into your life right here today for the first time or maybe in a renewing way, and as you have invited him back into your life to be at the very center, the core of your life, I say, Holy Spirit, come and fill these vessels with joy. Father, we know that it's a, joy and happiness is the fruit, 
the byproduct of your Holy Spirit in us. It's not the byproduct of what this world can do for us. We need your joy and it needs to be full, Father. I'm gonna let the worship team just sing this. You can sing and let's get into the presence of the Lord. And as you feel the leadership of the Holy Spirit, just receive the Holy Spirit's joy into your life. Say, come Holy Spirit, I receive your joy and posture yourself. But first, let's get this perspective. Let's get the mindset. And then I'm gonna just come around and lay hands on each one of you as, we, as they minister to us. But worship, worship the Lord and receive his joy this morning. This is the kingdom of heaven, asking he will. Asking he will This is the kingdom This is the kingdom This is the kingdom of heaven You will be This is the kingdom of heaven, asking he will, asking he will. This is the kingdom, this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom of heaven. of heaven seek first the kingdom and all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added all will be added all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added all will be added all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added seek first the kingdom and all will be added all will be added you will be filled you will be filled this is the kingdom this is the kingdom this is the kingdom of heaven asking he will asking he This is the kingdom of heaven. I just pray over you a fresh baptism of joy. A fresh baptism of joy over your life. Receive that. You need that. I need that. Father, we ask. You said ask anything and it shall be done. But we know that this asking is in complete agreement with abiding in you and your word abiding in us. So we ask, Father, we ask for a filling of your church with, the, with, the, with your Holy Spirit for joy. Joy, joy, joy. Receive the joy of the Lord this morning. The Lord says you are salt, you are light, but you are salt and light not because of who you are, but because of who I am, the Lord says. Receive me, receive me, receive me, receive me. We receive you, Father.
Aleluia There's somebody here that's facing a very dire earthly need Maybe more than one of you But the Lord says, here's what I want you to do First, I want you to trust me And then I want you to laugh I want you to laugh because that's the physical expression of joy. That is a physical expression of joy. And it may start with a laughter of faith, but faith will activate the presence of God and will initiate the grace of the Holy Spirit coming into that situation. Laugh. Laughter. Father, fill us with joy. Fill us with your strength. Fill us with the mindset of heaven. I'm going to continue to... we got some people ministering over people. So, okay, you have something to add? Scripture says that when even one repents heaven rejoices we had somebody give their life to jesus over here so let's rejoice let's rejoice <laughs> ashley look up look up you got a family today look up you got a family today <laughs> ashley needs our prayers she's facing a huge transition in 10 days and I, I prophesied over her just like you just made your heart the Lord's home. He will bring you a home. He will bring you a home. How many testimonies in this room about you needed a house and he brought it to you right when you needed it. <laughs> yeah, Amy. All right. I think I'm closing the service. Y'all don't go anywhere. I'm going to keep praying over y'all. And yes, Pastor Pete and Pastor Pam, where are you, Pam? Keep, come up here and are you holding the baby? Okay, you're ministering already. That's all right. We're going to pray for everybody who needs it. Be blessed. Remember, hold your hands up. There's joy in my hands. When you walk out of these doors today, don't just go home and make yourself lunch. Go give the joy away to somebody who needs it. They need a hug. They need a word. They need 10 bucks. I don't know what are, what are you going to use these hands for, but they're full of joy. Go give it away. Amen.